Case Update Episode 10 The Bizarre Murder of Arliss Perry Has Been Solved In Episode 10, I covered the bizarre murder of Arliss Perry. I'd recommend going back and listening to that episode for more extensive details. I'll list the episode link in the show notes, but to summarize shortly. In 1974, Arliss Perry was 19 years old and living with her then-husband, Bruce Perry, in a dorm designated for married couples on the campus of Stanford University in California. On October 12, 1974, Arliss planned to make a stop at a mailbox to send out some letters. The postal box was a short walk across campus from the dorm, and Bruce decided to tag along with her, being that it was late. The couple left the dorm at approximately 11.30 p.m. Somewhere during their walk, the two had an argument, and Arliss told Bruce to head back to the dorm as she was going to stop at the Stanford Memorial Church. The two parted ways at approximately 11.50 p.m. Security guard Steve Crawford spotted Arliss entering the church just before midnight. Two witnesses who left the church shortly after Arliss arrived reported seeing an unidentified man entering as they exited. When Crawford went to make his final check before locking the church up for the night, he called out to anyone who may be inside that it was time to close. According to Crawford, no one answered and when he walked the interior, he saw no one present. He then locked the church up as per his nightly routine. Arliss never returned home that night, and Bruce called the police at approximately 3 a.m. Officers did approach the church, but finding it locked, assumed Arliss had run into trouble on the way there. It wouldn't be until security guard Steve Crawford unlocked the church again at 5.45 a.m. that the terrible truth was known. Arliss was lying on the ground, partially undressed. She had been sexually assaulted by two altar candles and appeared to have been posed lewdly. She was deceased when discovered, and an ice pick was still lodged in her skull with the handle protruding from just behind her left ear. There were also rumors that she may have been strangled partially. While Arliss had been sexually assaulted using the candles, it did not appear as though her killer had forced himself on her, though semen was found on a pillow next to her body, and a palm print was later lifted from the candle. It was a grisly assault and murder, which shocked the locals and sent cries of satanic rituals and black magic careening over the campus and California. For the past 44 years, this case has baffled investigators. The brutality and savagery of the attack seemed to suggest, in the words of the time, a sexual psychopath, though police could never quite pin anyone to the crime. They had suspects, including security guard Steve Crawford, the son of Sam, members of the satanic group known as the Process Church, but not enough evidence to link any of them directly. As of today, Thursday, June 26, 2018, there's been breaking news regarding Arliss Perry's murder and the identification of the prime suspect. According to Sheriff Lori Smith of the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, cold case detectives led by Detective Sergeant Rick Alanis had been working on Arliss's case. According to investigators, they had been looking at the case for some time and recently launched a retesting of the original DNA evidence. This time, their testing resulted in a strong enough link to a suspect that they were able to obtain a warrant. They had reached out to the suspect in recent weeks, performed interrogations, but had not received enough evidence for a concrete link. Thanks to their DNA testing, today, officers from the Sheriff's Department arrived at the Del Coronado Apartments, located on Camden Avenue in San Jose, to execute their newly gained search warrant. According to Sergeant Enrique Garcia, 
sheriff's deputies arrived at approximately 9.04 a.m. They spoke to the occupant of the apartment through the door, identifying themselves as sheriff's deputies. They then opened the door and entered the apartment, at which time they noted that the occupant and suspect was holding a handgun. Deputies immediately backed up, exiting the apartment, and moments later, they heard a single gunshot. Upon re-entering, they found the suspect deceased of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Sheriff Smith stated, quote, He appears to have taken his own life. End quote. The San Jose Police Department took control of the scene, and the Sheriff's Department is treating it as an officer-involved shooting as the suicide occurred while official Sheriff's Department procedures were being conducted. At this moment, the search through the apartment is ongoing, though delayed by the necessity to properly control the suicide scene and investigate the death. As of this afternoon, multiple news outlets reported that the apartment building's manager, Leticia Gonzalez, identified the decedent and suspect as Steve Blake Crawford, the security guard who initially reported finding Arliss's body back in 1974. As of a press conference at 5.30 p.m., the Sheriff's Department in Santa Clara County confirmed that identification and listed this case as officially closed and resolved with Steve Blake Crawford as the murderer of Arliss Perry. Ruby Francisco, a neighbor of Crawford's, reported that he was a gray-haired man who appeared to be in his 70s. He was, in fact, 71. When building manager Gonzalez was asked about Crawford, she stated, quote, He's a good guy. Never had any problems. He kept to himself. All of us are shocked that this happened. End quote. She further described him as a well-dressed man who wore a cowboy hat and carried a cane. Crawford was reported to have moved into the studio apartment in 1993. Crawford faced legal trouble just one year before moving into the apartment in which he ended his life today. He had been arrested in 1992 under suspicion of having stolen nearly 300 rare books and pieces of art from Stanford University, where he had been working as a security guard. Over the years, Crawford was on the radar of investigators, though they never had enough information to label him as an official suspect to the public. There does appear to be some confusion, as it had been reported previously that Crawford had been tested against the evidence, but no link had been made. During the press conference, Sheriff Smith stated that he was never cleared through the testing of evidence. Of Crawford, Sheriff Smith stated, quote, he had been a suspect in the case for many years, but we didn't have the evidence until now, end quote. When Smith was asked about the investigation, she responded, quote, We have a cold case homicide unit, and they have been working this case actively since 1974. There's been a lot of increases in technology for DNA, and we were able to get more information that led us to believe that this was the suspect. That's why we were able to do the search warrant today. End quote. During the official Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department press conference, which took place at 5.30 p.m., Sheriff Smith made multiple statements in regard to the case and Crawford. When asked whether or not they knew for a fact that Crawford was in fact the killer, Sheriff Smith responded, This is a case that eludes us no longer. When asked about Arliss Perry, Smith responded, Her life and this case had value. When asked how it made her feel solving this case after 40 years, she responded, It's difficult for her family, it was difficult for the department, but we finally have closure in this case. The detectives had continually gone through the evidence, submitted additional evidence for testing. There was no DNA testing at the time of the murder, of course. Sheriff Smith specified that the DNA used to connect Crawford to the murder was taken from an item of Arliss's clothing. When asked point blank what had cleared Crawford in the past, she responded, quote, Nothing ever cleared him. 
there was just not enough evidence to charge him with a crime. End quote. She went on to explain that Crawford knew he was a person of interest and that investigators had been reaching out to him actively. When asked whether or not Arliss Perry knew Crawford, Sheriff Smith responded, quote, I don't think we have any evidence at this time that they knew each other. End quote. When asked about the possibility that Crawford may have committed other unsolved crimes, she responded, quote, Not that we're aware of now, but we're continuing to follow up. End quote. According to Sheriff Smith, family members have been notified of the resolution of this case, and they were appreciative of that notification. There will be another press conference tomorrow in which further information will be released. So finally, after 44 years, this horrendous and gruesome crime has been solved, and Arliss Perry's murderer has been identified as former security guard Steve Blake Crawford. When I covered this case back in episode 10, there was certain information available at the time which resulted in the theories being a little off. For the past 44 years, the consensus in the media has been that Steve Crawford had been tested against the known evidence and that because there were no matches, he had been ruled out. Sheriff Smith has made it clear that while not enough evidence existed for an arrest, he was never cleared. When I covered this case, I felt that Crawford's story was bizarre. I didn't necessarily think he'd committed the crime, but I didn't understand how he could have checked the church, as he alleged, and not noticed that Arliss and her would-be killer were inside. Now it makes sense, since it seems that the man himself was the killer, and his lack of credibility in his story was due to his involvement in the crime. Looking at the crime, there are several aspects of it which result in me believing that there's more to this story we may learn in the future. The murder was brutal. The sexual assault was horrifying. The posing was lewd and disgusting. Is it possible that Crawford committed this crime, having never committed others, and then went the rest of his life without murdering or sexually assaulting anyone else? Yeah, but it seems unlikely. I find it difficult to accept that this was the only crime he ever committed. The psychopathy present here certainly points to a disturbed individual. Crawford was a security guard, watching over the church and campus, and as such had access to campus and the building when others did not. Knowing how many sexual assaults take place on college campuses and fail to get reported, I can't help but wonder if additional investigation will tie Crawford to other crimes which have been unsolved. DNA is becoming a huge thing lately in terms of solving cases. We've all been joyful about the Golden State Killer case being broken, and we're seeing more and more of that happening. Just today I was reading about additional DNA work being done in the Molly Bish case. I'm hopeful that as we progress further and technology advances, that we'll see many of the unsolved cases that have haunted us for so many years solved. In Arliss Perry's case, in total honesty, I considered it unlikely that we were going to see this case solved. It's been 44 years, and the likelihood was low. But thanks to the hard work and determination of the Cold Case Homicide Unit working in the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department, today, this horrible crime has been given a resolution. Unfortunately, we may never know for certain what happened that night due to Crawford committing suicide as the police were at his door. While it sickens me to imagine that this horrible person was able to walk free and do God knows what else for the past 44 years, I'm comforted in knowing that he's gone from this world. While it was a coward's way out, rather than facing justice, he's been outed as a brutal and violent man whose name will forever be linked to this terrible event, though hopefully his name will fade from memory. For Arliss's family and loved ones, I hold out hope that while this answer cannot bring her back, nor answer the haunting question of why, perhaps now knowing who was responsible will grant them some modicum of closure and peace. The resolution of this case opens doors to many other possibilities other potential victims, other cold cases to which Crawford may have been connected, 
However, it also grants us a light of hope. So many of the cases I cover feel as though they'll never be solved. So many of the victims I've profiled seem unlikely to be found or to receive justice. And yet each day we get closer and closer, with more cases being cracked and more answers being supplied. I work in the business of the unsolved, and I can say with certainty, were I to be put out of business and all these cases find their answers, I'd be incredibly happy to close up shop. Thank you so much for listening to this update. If you haven't heard my coverage of the case, make sure you go back and check out episode 10, The Bizarre Murder of Arliss Perry, which I will now be able to add this update to the end of and list the case as solved. Subscribe, rate, and review. Visit me on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, join the Facebook discussion group by searching for Trace Evidence, and visit the website at trace-evidence.com. I want to send a special thank you to Laura, host of The Fall Line, for bringing this update to my attention earlier today. Hopefully, this will be the first of many of these cases being solved. I want to thank you for listening to Trace Evidence, and I'll see you next week with another unsolved case.